CPC, accounting for your future. Hi, this is Dave from APC. So in this video, I'm going to tell you the basis of auditing. It's how we're going to audit, okay, from the auditor's point of view. So just write this down. So basis of audit. So all we need to do is to follow the six steps when doing the audit. So every audit firm will focus upon the six steps, okay? So in, in every audit firm across the globe, that's how they do the audit. What do I mean by audit is what do I mean by check? So we are going to check whether or not the financial statements of the company is actually correct. So how are we going to order them? How are we going to check them? So we're going to follow the six steps. The step number one being, this is the acceptance stage. So all we're going to do within the acceptance stage is that we're going to accept the contract with the client's company. Because we're going to check the client's company, as far as the statement, so that before we check that, of course, we need to get the permission of the client's company, so then we're going to check that. And because we're doing the work, because we are profit making organisations from all the firm's perspective, and surely we're going to charge amount of fees onto the client's company. So that has to be written down into the contracts of example, and hence that's the acceptance stage. And the contract that we are going to sign with the client's company is what we call the engagement letter. Okay. So engagement letter actually details who does this audit, the time period, also the fees that is going to charge onto the client's company as well, and also the responsibilities of the auditors as well as the management within the client's company. So that's within the acceptance stage. But from the auditor's perspective, one of the most important things that we need to bear in mind during the acceptance stage is where we're going to check whether or not the client's company is the going concern status, is the going concern entity. What do I mean by going concern is what I mean by whether or not the company, whether or not the client's company would trade its business for more than 12 months after the financial statement year event. And if this is not the case, from an auditor's perspective, we should never accept, the, accept us the auditor for this company. Because if the client's company is not a going concern entity anymore, very, very easy to go into bankruptcies, for example. And hence, maybe the client's company will have no money to pay for you when you complete the audit. But the next question is, why does that matter? You may ask yourself, can't I help the client's company a little bit? Well, the answer for that is no, you cannot do that. The simple idea behind it is because from an auditor's perspective, we are acting in the public interest. This means that a lot of people will use our audit report to make their investment decisions. If we lie to those investors, for example, we are not ethical. If the client's company has no money to pay for auditor, this means that maybe the client's company may force the auditor to give a wrong audit opinion. So that, of course, the auditor can secure their fees. So if this is the case, of course, we are acting against the public's interests and this is not allowed. And hence, very, very importantly, you have to say whether or not the client's company is a going concern entity before you accept the engagement letter with the client's company. So after you accepted the engagement with the client's company, the next thing you're going to do is going to plan your audit. So planning your audit is particularly tough to be perfectly honest with you. So planning the audit, we are mainly dealing with these two circumstances. Firstly, we need to set up our audit strategy 
And secondly, we're going to set up the detail for the plan. So let me just give you an example, because from an auditor's perspective, we are going to check the financial statements of the client's company. For example, we are going to check the non-current asset within the SFP of the client's company. So that the audit strategy being, we are going to assign John to audit the non-current asset. We are going to assign Jackie to audit the financial instruments within the FS. So that's what I mean by audit strategy. But what do I mean by audit plan? Is we are going to talk about how we're going to audit the detailed balances. For example, how we're going to audit the non-current asset. Maybe we're going to check the non-current asset register. We're going to recalculate the depreciation expenses for the non-current asset, for example. We're going to verify whether or not the non-current asset actually exists within the company by physically ins ins inspecting the non-current asset. So that's the detailed audit plan of how we're going to do it. Of course, there will be a lot more other bits and pieces within the strategy as well as the detailed audit plan. Of course, we're going to see all of them in the due course. But the basic idea behind that is that that's how we're going to plan the audit. All this JJ talks about the big thing. It talks about the scope of the audit, it's the timing of the audit, the direction, the nature of the audit. The audit plan actually deals with the risky areas, the plan audit procedures, as well as the materiality that we're going to look at in due course. So that's the second stage here. So, of course, very, very importantly, when planning your audit, normally we hold a plan, uh, we hold a uh, planning meeting, yeah, gathering all of these auditors together. The scientists come up with ideas of how to audit the financial statements of the client's company. But one of the key elements within the audit plan is where we're going to focus upon the system within the client's company. It's what do I mean by the internal control system of the client's company. So, internal control system is nothing new. All we mean by internal control system is the system in place in making sure that a business is doing its business correctly. For example, we've got the internal control system in place within the company that if one particular you know, uh, taxable profit has been arrived at, so let me just write down here, if we arrive at the taxable profit, that the system will try to generate the latest tax rate to calculate the tax expenses for the company. So for example, the taxable profit, we're going to times the tax rate, which will give us the tax expense. The taxable profit, 10. The tax rate we're going to apply for this particular year is to be 15%. So the tax expenses total what is to be 1.5, so for example, 20, of course that will become 3. That's the internal control system. This means that, of course, we're going to make sure the tax rate is correct, but what if it is not correct? So we're going to assess that client's internal control system. For example, the correct figure should have been 15%. But the client says to you, well, the tax rate is just to be 10%. The reason behind that is that the client's company may try to have some of the creative accounting, for example, to understate the expenses within the income statement, for example. And hence, if I'm going to apply the wrong tax rate in this particular case, the tax expenses is to be one and two. So, very, very important now, you're going to plan your audit, you're going to assess the internal control system of the client's company, for example, trying to make sure the tax rate is correct, applied into the taxable profit. Because if this is not the case, as you can see here, there will be thousands of transactions of the taxable profit 
in each of these months. There'll be 12 transactions as an example. Maybe it will be very, very time consuming for you to check all of these transactions one by one. Yes? But a more efficient way for you to do is that you can directly check the tax rates okay, that the company has applied. If we can guarantee that the tax rate applied is correct, 15% instead of 10%, and also we can guarantee that taxable profit is correct as well, we don't have to audit the tax expenses anymore because we see we can guarantee that applying the tax rate, correct tax rate, to the correct taxable profit, that should give us the correct tax expense. So we're not going to spend lots of time to audit those tax expenses one by one, but rather we're going to check the system whether or not this is correct. Okay, so that's why we're going to check the system. The reason why we're going to check the system is not going to spot the errors within the client's company and tell the client's company what's going on because it's not our responsibility. All we're going to do is that firstly, we like to make the audit more efficient because by checking the system, by making sure the system is correct, is appropriate, surely the transaction there will be appropriate as well. So instead of checking each of these transactions, thousands of transactions in turn, we're going to check the system uh, rather than checking thousands of transactions. The second reason behind that, why we're going to check the system, is because in some of the circumstances, if the system error is so significant to the company, we need to report this to the audit committee. The reason behind that is because in some of the circumstances that the management within the business would like to do a lot of creative accounting, would like to make, would like to make that the internal two systems not perfect because by doing so they can get the personal gain out of the system. For example, maybe the CEO will not try to perform the bank will not the company will not try to perform the bank reconciliation because this is required by the CEO. So that the company is not going to perform the bank reconciliation monthly. So from that perspective then that the CEO can get this money from the company into their into his own pockets very very easily, isn't it? By lack of this internal control procedure. But because of this assist within the client's company, from the auditor's perspective, because the fraud within the company will be significant irrespective of the amount that it incurs. We need to report this to the audit committee. So that's why we're going to check the system. In recap, why we're going to check the system is because we're going to make sure that the, uh, that the audit work is efficient, it's highly efficient, and secondly, we're going to report any of this uh, fraudulent transaction, fraudulent activity to the audit committee because it is the prime responsibility of the directors within the organisation to make sure that the internal control system is sound. Okay, so that's the stage number three okay so let's move on to the stage number four of the audit flow chart of how we're going to perform the audit so stage number four is what we're trying to actually do the substantive testing so what do i mean by substantive testing is what I mean by we are focusing on the figures. We are focusing on a particular figure of trying to check it. For example, by spotting the non-current asset within the SFP, the non-current asset is worth $10 million within the client's company. So that we're going to detail this non-current asset of $10 million into a lot of this sub transactions. Maybe we purchase a non-current asset, maybe we revalue the non-current asset during the year. For example, if we purchase the non-current asset during the year worth of $5 million, for example, maybe we're going to inspect 
the contract relating to it. Maybe we're going to inspect the invoices relating to it as well. We're going to make sure that the figures is been updated into the non current asset register as well as the SFP. So those are the procedures, those are the substantive procedures in place making sure that the $5 million within the non current asset, uh, within the SFP, is correct. That's what I mean by substantive testing. So we are focusing on the figures. Okay, so of course we've got other elements as well. So for example, the inventory, how are we going to check that? The cash balances, the receivable balances, the payable balances, also some other advanced accounting bit as well. Of course we're going to look at that in due course. So once we perform this stage one, accepting the engagement letter with the client's company, planning the audit, go through the system with the client's company, performing the substantive testing by checking the figures, the next thing we're going to do is where we're going to review the work that we've done. So one of the most important elements within the review stage of the audit is where we're going to say, are there any transactions needs to be corrected by the company? So for example, after the financial statement year ends, there would be a lot of transaction happening after the financial statement year ends, before we sign the audit report, before we issue the financial statement. So normally, after the financial statement year end, we now sign the audit report. So after we sign the audit report, we're going to issue the financial statement to different shareholders, for example. There'll be lots of transactions happening after the financial statement year end, for example. The inventory is burned by a fire, takes place after the financial statement year end. So all of this inventory got damaged. So from this perspective then, should we reduce the inventory value within the SFP as at the year end? Or we just disclose that in the notice of the financial statements telling the users that the fire happens after the financial statement year end. Which one are you going to choose? So that is something to do with the IAS number 10, events after the reporting period. And this particular circumstance, because the fire cannot be predicted as at the year end, as at the financial statement year end, so that we are not going to reduce the value of the inventory as at the financial statement year end, but rather we're going to disclose that to the user of the financial statement, namely shareholders. So that's why we're going to review all of these transactions, you know, not only before the financial statement year end, yeah? Because what we've done is where we're going to plan the work and then we're going to start testing those figures. But maybe things will happen after the financial statement year end as well. We need to take into account of that. And of course, during the review stage of the audit, there'll be lots more other things that we have to do. Of course, we're going to see all of them in the due course as well. And finally, the step number six is where we're going to issue the audit report. In other words, it's where we're going to give our audit opinion. It's where we're going to say that whether or not the financial statements of the client's company is correct or not correct. So that we're going to detail that into the audit report, telling the shareholders whether or not the, uh, the directors, the finance director you have employed, is acting ethically and professionally or not. Okay, because for example, maybe the finance director is going to manipulate the financial statement, but this is not allowed. As from the auditor's perspective, we have to correct this, okay? Because we are working not for the directors, we are working for the shareholders, because we are engaged by the shareholders to check the director's work, whereas the directors are employed by the shareholders. Okay, so that's the six steps of how we're going to perform the audit. Just to recap, the step one is where we're going to sign a contract with the client's company. And once you've done that, we're going to plan how to audit by setting up the strategy as well as the detailed audit plan. One of the most important elements within that is where we're going to go through 
the interlocutor system of the clients can play. Because there will be two reasons behind that. Firstly, we like to make the audit more efficient. And secondly, if we find any of these fraudulent transactions, for example, we're going to report that to the audit committee. So once we've gone through the step three, we're going to move on to step four, is we're going to check the figures within the financial statements in turn. So after we're done with that, of course, we're going to review all of this work that's been done by our auditors, making sure the work that's been done by the auditors are absolutely correct. If this is not the case, of course, the clients company will sue our audit firms later on if we have done any of these mistakes and leading to the clients company suffering a loss. So after we make sure all of these bits and pieces is no problem whatsoever is what we're going to move on to step six, going to issue our audit opinion saying whether or not the financial statements of the clients company is correct or not correct. Okay, so that finishes off the basis of audit in this video. APC, accounting for your future.